me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Green Grass and White Bases podcast. I'm your host, Eric Reardon. Super excited to be joined today by baseball warehouse alum, Ryder baseball alum, Joe Papio. Um, reporting live from location here in Highland Park, New Jersey, uh, rainy day here. So we're excited to, to chop it up a little bit, talk some baseball and kind of put away these rainy day blues by getting into the stuff that, uh, that we're interested in. So a little background on Joe, left-handed pitcher, spent five years at Ryder given the COVID year that, uh, that we all had to deal with a couple years back now. Almost 240 innings pitched in college, 188 strikeouts in those innings, 43 career starts. So this is a guy that he's been around the block in college baseball. He's come up through our program here at the warehouse. And so that's, uh, that's going to be the focus of our conversation today, just getting into what it looks like growing up here in Middlesex County, growing up in this program, in this environment, what high school baseball looks like, travel baseball looks like, getting us to that college level, and then what D1 baseball looks like as a starting pitcher. So um, really excited for the conversation, really excited to share Joe's insights. He's a Old Bridge High School graduate back in the day. So um, family's been really connected here at the baseball warehouse with his two younger brothers, Tommy and, uh, and Frankie, playing on the 2023 team here now. So um, Joe, Pumped to have you on, man. Thanks for joining me. And just if there's any background stuff that I missed, feel free to share. Nope, you got it all, all right? Uh, just thanks thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to do this. So uh, let's get into it. Um, so like you said, Old Bridge High School, I um, started out uh, at Old Bridge High School. Um, senior year, not many looks coming out of uh, going into college, right? I think I had about three or four Division One offers. Um, talked to Rutgers for a little bit, so we could have been teammates, but it didn't work out. But uh, so I ended up at Ryder. Um, my senior year of high school, I'm 6'2", 175 pounds, a soft throw and lefty 72, I'm sorry, 78 to 82 miles per hour. So uh, Ryder took a chance on me and gave me an opportunity to play there. You know, you don't see many 82 mile per hour lefties now getting uh, D1 offers. So back then it was a little different, you know, about uh, five, six years ago. Um, I get to Ryder. Um, well, first, let me say my, in the recruit recruiting f phase, uh, all I was really worried about is where I was going to play. You know, I really wanted to have the opportunity to compete for a spot, right? And well, that's good. It did also hurt me a little bit too, because that was really my main focus, right? So I really wasn't worried about like player development, how the school was. I just wanted to play. That was like my only, my only focus. I wanted to be able to play where I went, you know? So I get to Ryder, uh, my freshman year, again, 175 pounds. I'm going to mention my weight a lot here because that's a big part of my career. Um, and I get there and it's like a big shock, you know? Um, I really wasn't, I don't want to say I wasn't ready, but I wasn't, I was surprised on like what college baseball was and like what I got myself into almost. Right. So we get there and, uh, in the fall, um, in the winter, you know, we're, it's almost, I don't want to say boot camp, but it, it, it's almost what it was, you know, we're running like five to six, seven miles a week, you know, and then like you have your classes, you have, um, practice extra work that we'll talk about later. And like, uh, it was hard, you know, my freshman year was hard, you know, um, I wasn't able to maintain weight. I wasn't able to maintain velo. I wasn't able to gain velo, you know, so springtime rolls around now, right? I'm, I, I lose, I'm 165 pounds and I'm throwing the ball even slower than when I got there. Right. So I didn't really look into the player development aspect and like what the, pro, what it was going to be like when I got there. Right. And it's not, I'm not taking anything away from what we did at, uh, Ryder because it's, an upcoming program. It's been really well, been doing really well. Um, MAC championship appearances the last two years, winning one, which we'll get into. But I didn't really focus on that. I didn't think it was. It didn't matter to me. Like I just said, I just wanted to play. You know, I wanted the chance to compete for for a spot. So um, I get there my uh, freshman year. All that goes on. I have a really tough fall. Um, training wise, I, I threw the ball fine. I pitched. I pitched well. Training wise and um, weightlifting wise and all that stuff, I had a really tough time. You know, I lost 10 pounds now. And then when I get home in the winter, 
I'm so exhausted on what happened in the fall and the winter that I almost need a break. I need like a two week break or else I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to the spring. So that's also hurt me too when I played in the winter when college athletes are supposed to really take advantage of that time. I was behind. All right. And a lot of that has to do with me and my fault and not being ready. But uh, that's just something that happened throughout my career, or at least the first two years. But again, uh, springtime rolls around, 165 pounds, throwing the ball 82 miles per hour, right? I remember uh, I had the opportunity to pitch the first game um, of the season my freshman year, and there's me who's throwing the ball 82 miles per hour against the Ohio starter who's throwing a slider 84, 85. So I'm like, what is like, what is going on? Like, what's happening, right? Anyway, I get through my freshman year, same thing happens. Sophomore year, right? I know I have to make changes, but again, with the type of conditioning that we did, I wasn't able to maintain weight. I wasn't able to gain weight, right? And I kind of accepted the role of, you know what? I'm just not a guy that's going to throw the ball hard. That's just how it's going to work. I'm, I'm, my main focus is I need to be available. I need to stay healthy. I need to get outs. And I just, I need to eat up innings. I need to make sure like I can get outs for my team. I need to work for my team. So another limitation I put on myself was I'm, I just don't throw the ball hard. You know, that's just, that's how it goes. You're just one of those guys. So you're soft throwing lefty. That's how it works. You know? So that was a limitation I put on myself. Same thing happens. I have the same type of year stats wise. I had a better year, right? But that's just, that's just how it went. So my first two years of my college career, there was zero player development on my end, right? And there was a lot of variables that went on with that. A lot of it's my fault. Most of it's my fault, but that's just how it went. Uh, then we get to my junior year, which is my COVID year. Um, that was a wash, you know, but my junior year and my senior year, that that's when I really looked at myself in the mirror and I said, all right, something has to be done here because I saw guys on my team who didn't really work as hard or didn't really do the things I did. And which again, nothing against them, but they were throwing the ball way harder than me. And I was doing twice the work. So I said to myself, something's wrong here. So after COVID my senior year, I decided, okay, I need to make a change in my body. I need to gain weight and I need to get strong. Right? So my junior summer going into senior year and my senior year fall, was probably the strongest I've ever been, right? And I was up to like now 190, 195 pounds. I get on the mound my senior year fall, throw, in, throw my outings, blah, blah, blah. I look at the radar gun, I'm topping 84 miles per hour. So that right there was the biggest like wake up call to me in my career. And that's where my whole career like kind of changed. I said, I said to myself, I said, okay, something else needs to be done, but you got big, you got stronger. You know, I'm still not as heavy as I'm supposed to be, but you got stronger and you're one of the strongest kids on the team now, but why, why am I not throwing the ball hard? Right? So I just take a look and I just take a deep dive in mechanics, which me and you have talked about before. Like why is my weightlifting not transitioning to my mound velo? Right. And me and my good friend, uh, Kenny, who really helped me a lot, I owe him a lot, we took a deep dive into mechanics and um, what was wrong with my, myself and what was wrong with what I was doing. And um, the amount of extra work I did just to focus on mechanics, which like, again, we'll get into, was, was crazy. So the biggest thing that happened to me in my career was just looking at myself and saying, okay, something needs to change. Why, why can I do this? You know, why... I need to break that limitation on myself and say, I can throw the ball harder. So we took a deep dive in mechanics, right? And like I said before this, I didn't know anything. You know, I, my main goal was like, all right, get outs. That's it, right? Just get, that's your job, get outs, right? I, there was only one focus I had at pitching and that was getting out. I didn't think about anything else. But um, so we took a deep dive into my mechanics. We fixed a lot of things. And then I had a big velo jump my senior year of college. I, it, it was kind of weird because my first two or three outings of my senior year, I was throwing top in 85. And then one day I go out and I'm up to 88, 89. And then after that, it just, it just stayed like that and took off. And then, uh, my 
senior year of college, we winded up winning the tournament, which was great. It was crazy because in my first two years, we won a combined 29 games. We won 12 my first year, excuse me, and then 17 my next year, which is horrible, you know. So we winded up winning the conference, um, and then my senior year comes, and uh, I had a uh, my Vila fluctuated big time with that. Uh, that year, I didn't know. Sometimes I'd go out and throw the ball low to mid 80s, and sometimes I go out and throw the ball high 80s, uh, touching 90. So, I mean, um, and what really happened with me my senior year, which happens to, I feel like, a lot of players now, is my senior year, I was trying to find that certain thing that would, would make it click, right? So I was bouncing around, do, trying this, trying that, when I should have just been staying course and sticking to a program, and I didn't, right? So, like, any like young guys listening to this, which you should be, um, it's a great podcast and everything. Um, that's something that you should really like, stay away from, you know, stick to a program and stay with it. Because my senior year, I was looking for something to get me that extra mile, extra two or three miles per hour. And instead that hurt me more than it helped me. Yeah, man. I mean, a lot of great information there to unpack. I think the first thing that stands out to me is there's a lot of talk that goes on these days about like just how early the recruiting process is happening. And I know we both help out coaching the 2025 team here at yeah. the warehouse. And a lot of those guys who are just entering their sophomore year of high school are looking for college scholarships and rankings on these platforms and things of that nature. And I know from our perspective, you know, you being only a year younger than me, mm. when we were in high school, that wasn't the nature of the beast. Like when you yeah. got to your sophomore year, when we were in high school, coaches would tell you, you have so much time. Yeah left in your recruiting process. So speak to that a little bit and just that, you know, how that opportunity was still available to you later on in your high school career and you were able to go pitch at a really high level at a D1 school, even committing, I think you said, towards the end of your senior year of high school, right? Yeah, I, I think I committed in May of my senior year of high school. So the season is over almost at that point, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, like you said, like today, like you have kids like their sophomore years who are, who are much better than like I was when I was a sophomore, right? So like, I didn't even have the opportunity to like get a college look my sophomore year of high school. But like you said, coach, you said you have a lot of time, right? Which I felt like it, right? Um, again, like I said, Ryder took a chance on me throwing 78 to 81, 82 miles per hour. So um, I, I don't know, like, it's a good question. Like you have more time than you think, right? But at the end of the day, like, I wish I got I got started sooner rather than how late I did. If you get what I'm saying, right? Like, um, for me, like I said, it's just where I wanted to compete for a spot, and Ryder gave me that chance. So I mean, I did have more time in high school, but now looking back at it, if I knew more than I, more, if I knew what I knew now, I would have I could have handled things differently, right? But again, like I said, I, I didn't know anything. I didn't I didn't know anything about pitching. Right. Right. And that's, that's the tough part looking back on it is, you know, if, if we knew then what we knew now, how much different would things have panned out? Yeah. Right. So I guess given that, right, like being on the coaching side of things now, what are some of the things you would tell our guys? I know we get these questions all the time, but to a larger audience, right? Like what are some of the things you would tell guys who are in your shoes now where you were at your sophomore, junior year of high school? What, couple things that you would tell them as far as the recruiting process goes and getting their info out there. Yeah. So yeah, it's a great question because like personally I have that going on right now. Like my brother Thomas, he is a senior in high school and same situation as I was in, right? He's going to be a late commit. He's, he doesn't know where he's going to go. Right. But the main thing I would say is everyone develops at a different time, right? The, certain things happen. You get bigger, faster, stronger as you get older, right? Some people are late bloomers. Some people are early bloomers, right? So the main thing, right, it's going to sound cliche, is just to keep working at it. Keep keep going, right? You know, if you really want to do it, like, you'll do it, you know? So, I mean, it doesn't matter, right? Again, like, nobody cares if you commit your sophomore year. Nobody care, cares if you commit your senior year, right? And nobody cares when you get there, you know? Right. So... Uh, it's just like keep working at it, right? You know, you never know when you're going to get your opportunity. You never know when someone's going to take a chance on you, right? And even if nobody takes a chance on you, right, you still have to prove to yourself now I can do this, right? Again, I talked about putting limitations on myself and kind of closing off to myself. Yeah, I'm this guy and that's, I mean, that's what, that's what it is, right? I mean, you really can't do that. And that was a mistake I made, right? And that's something I would tell, 
um, kids in this in that situation and younger kids, right? It doesn't matter when you commit as long as you just keep working at it, right? Um, especially like what, that's what college coaches are looking for, right? I mean, it's a kid that's willing to work, yeah, right? So, I mean, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter when you commit. It doesn't matter what you did in high school. It doesn't matter what you're going to do, like, when you get there, right? You, you have to work for it. Like, you have, it, that's the only thing. You have to work for it. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And I think, like you're saying with how, you, you know, you're not, you're not sure where you're going to end up. You're not sure what opportunities you're going to get. I know from a Division three perspective at Rutgers Newark, like, we – love the guys that are late bloomers, right? Mm -hmm. We, at the D3 level, a lot of the recruiting gets done the summer after your junior year of high school, going through the summer following your senior year of high school. So we get a lot of commit, uh, a lot of kids that commit at the same time you did. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of like a jumping off point I want to look at here where you're talking about not setting limitations on yourself and just the ownership aspect of it, right? These kids that want to keep working. I think with the nature of the beast of recruiting these days, a lot of kids feel like if they don't start getting those calls or emails or letters in the mail by the time they're a sophomore in high school, that they've already missed the opportunity. So speak to that ownership that you're talking about a little bit. I know, you know, you've shouldered a lot of the burden here saying that you thought you were one kind of guy and you had some struggles early on and it took you a couple of years to fix that. But I think there's some importance in the fact that you were able to look yourself in the mirror consistently throughout your college career and say, these are the things I want to get better at. And as much as, especially from like a lesson perspective, like we do now, right? Like every time a kid does something wrong in a lesson, you're just teaching him that that's a way you don't do it. Yeah. So now you know how to adjust against that, right? So I think throughout your career, maybe that's something that something similar that went on where it was like, listen, this stuff hasn't worked for me so far, but at least late in your career, you knew that wasn't the answer. And then luckily enough, you were able to find that answer. So I think what's, what's important to me from that is the ownership you took over your own process and what worked for you and then finally finding it. So yeah. just speak to it, right? Like it's easy to say, and I'm sure kids hear all the time, you got to continue to work hard. You have to continue to get after it. But on a more personal level and in a way that's like applicable and that works, what does that ownership mean to you? And just staying conscious of where you're at and making sure you put the effort in. Yeah. So again, like I said, like the, I said to myself, I put myself in a category where like, okay, you're, you're a soft throwing lefty, right? Also, that's what I've heard my whole life too. You're a soft throwing lefty. That's the type of guy you are. You're just here to get outs. And again, like when I say get outs, that's your main goal as a pitcher. You're Absolutely. out there to get outs, right? You see kids now who are like throw the balls, throw the ball hard, but can't get outs, right? Again, it's both sides of the spectrum here. You want to throw the ball hard and you also want to get outs, right? So pitchers really have to find like the combination of both, right? But like talking about the ownership part of it, like, Again, I don't want to sound cliche, but like you just have to commit to yourself. This is going to take more than you think it, it really is. Right. And again, um, and a lot of it is being in a team environment. Right. Like I talked about, um, I had a I had a teammate who would go to the facility with me every single night and help me out every single night. And you said this is something you did in college, too. Like, again, I would do dry drills for hours, just like the simplest stuff that like Again, I'm behind, right? So I need to now I need to work extra to do this, right? And again, I mean like it's not like it's not like a pat on the, on the back type of thing. This is what you're supposed to do, you right. know? Like this is like you know, you don't get you don't like no one claps for you for working hard. This is what you're supposed to do, you know? So ownership is like the biggest thing. Like you have to you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, "Look, you're not you're not good enough right now." or you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you need to take it a step up, right? Like, again, like, do you want to get to your end, of your, uh, end of your career and say, yeah, I gave it half of what I should have, or I, I gave it most of what I could. I gave it all I had, right? You know, and trust me, there's still things that I think I should have done that I didn't when I was in my career, and which probably leads to why I don't play anymore and stuff like that. But I definitely felt like I... I did give it, I gave it my all, right? And a lot of that, what you're saying is comes to, comes with the ownership, right? Looking yourself in the mirror and saying, look, this is what you need to do. And um, again, like being in a team environment and your teammates helping you out. It's like, again, when you get into college, right? I, we talk to a lot of seniors and uh, juniors here. It, it's, it's a different beast, you know? Like you have classes, you have, like you have to you have to find times to fit meals in, right? So like it's hard. Right? It's definitely not easy, right? 
it might come easier to some people and it might come harder to some people, but it's definitely not easy, right? So if you're a college ath athlete, like you deserve a lot of credit, you know, that's something that's really hard. But um, at a certain point, if you want to take your game to the next level, you got to stop feeling sorry for yourself and you got you to gotta just do the things that, again, like I say, you're supposed to do. You know, we talk about, um, we both coach your 25s here, right? I tell my team all the time, you know, and I'm definitely uh, harder on my team than I should be sometimes. And like my guys watching this, they'll know this, right? I'm not, I, I tell them, you know, congratulations, but this is what you're supposed to do. Like, like I know I don't want to be a hard all the time, but this, like you did what you were supposed to do and the outcome happened because you, that's what you did, right? So, I mean, that's just like, again, like doing what you're supposed to do, right? Right. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the thing that sticks out to me from that is, you know, you're going through your background in the beginning and you're saying, well, I woke up one day and then I was upper 80s instead of lower 80s. But your, your process to get there has a lot to do with that, right? Like I think there's some lyric out there, some rapper says it took 10 years for me to be an overnight success, Yeah. right? So I think all of those pieces you're talking about play a part into getting you to that position where it's like, holy crap, now I'm an 88 mile an hour guy or a 90 mile an hour right. guy instead of an 84 mile an hour guy. And like you're saying, that ownership is what makes that process run in that when things don't work, it's not time to hit the brake pedal and stop working. Mm -hmm. It's time to continue looking for things, whether that's a deep dive into your mechanics, whether that's asking your teammates for help and going after it with them all the time. And like you're saying, like once you get to that college level, it's a lot more individualized. Mm -hmm. And I think it's awesome to grow in an environment like this one in high school where you have a bunch of guys around you all have the same goal. They all want to get to that college level. There's almost a 0% chance all your buddies you play with in high school are going to end up on your same college team. Yeah, 100%. So the principles that you learn in an environment like this, whether it be your high school team or your travel program, you have to be able to carry them when the coach isn't pushing you in college. Mm -hmm. The dynamic starts to change a little bit there where it's the coaches in the college level are going to put the best guys on the field so yeah. that they can win ball games. Here, you only have 12 guys on your roster, so yeah. everybody has to play, right? And I think what, uh, what I do want to mention about you saying the hard work is what's required, right? Like, I know at our practices all the time, and maybe we are a little tougher on mm -hmm. those guys than, than most, but we talk a lot about how like someone will have like a rep where they just execute the play and there's a lot of attaboys and yeah. let's go going on. And I think something that I've noticed we stress is like, don't add a boy your buddy for a regular play. Mm -hmm. Like there has to be a way to know that that's what's expected of him. Mm -hmm. Sure, if he makes a diving play in the hole and gets up and throws a runner out at first, you can add a boy that, or yeah. if a guy hits a homer, right? Like that's an add a boy, but. I think that's an important thing to note is that like working hard is not something that makes you stand out. Working hard is what's required yeah. for this process. Right. And so what, what I get to in my mind off of that, the next step is right. You put in all this hard work and then later on in your career, you guys go ahead at Ryder and win the Mac championship. You get an opportunity to play in a regional. So tell that story because that's something I missed out on. That's one of my biggest regrets from college is never, never helping my team get to a point where we could play in the postseason like that. So just take us through that a little bit about what it looked like to get to that point, especially given some struggles early on in your career with mm -hmm. the team. And then how awesome was it going down to Louisiana Tech and playing in a regional? Yeah. So again, like my career individually and within a team is like a tale of just two stories. Like if you split my freshman and sophomore year and again, no junior year, senior and fifth year, if you split them together, it's two different careers, team wise and individual wise, right? Uh, again, with Ryder, my first two years, um, win 12 games my first year and 17 games my next year, and we tie the record in losses, whatever that was, my sophomore year. So you're, I'm like, oh my, like what, what did I get myself into? Like, what, like what's going on here? Like, I want to win, you know? And again, I did feel like we were behind the eight ball, right? We were young and... I just thought like individually, some of the things we were doing individually as a team just weren't great, right? Junior year happens. COVID year was probably the biggest thing I thought that happened as a team for like Ryder because we got into a lot more individual practices and in small groups. Like you said, it's not as indiv individualized as you might think, right? You have to go do work on your own stuff like that. But that gave the team more opportunity to do individualized stuff, small groups and stuff like that, right? Um, and then we kind of just flipped it around at the, as a program, right? What we were doing got better 
like our training got better, everything got better, right? And uh, trust me, uh, Ryder is like definitely moving up, right? You know, like like I said, M Mac Championship win two years ago, Mac Championship loss my last year, right? So like you get you make the back back to back Mac Championships. That's something to sneeze at, you know. No doubt. Um, so again, once we get to my senior year, we it was just like a total flip flop of the whole program, right? And we coach now, right? So we're gonna we, we're gonna talk about leadership, like within coaching and stuff like that. Le the leadership change within from the coaches to the players, right? My class and the class above me, we weren't. Again, there's different ways to be a leader, right? As you know, right? I wasn't a very vocal guy. I just like to work, and I, you know, I want I want to motivate guys to work around me by seeing how I work. And then we had some guys on our team like uh, Pete Saporowski, who you know, yeah, right, who's a very vocal guy, and he gets everyone going, right? So the leadership from my senior year to my, from my freshman year, just completely different. And like a word we, we used at Ryder was culture, right? So the culture was completely different, right? So we're short in season, our senior year, we're only playing 36 games, I think it was. And um, like, it's difficult, you know, because a 50, a 60 game college season is tough, but then at the same time, you play 33, 36 games all conference. Every single game matters. Every single game, right? So we have we have a good season. I think we went twenty three and eighteen or something like that, right? And um, uh, at the end of our season, we lose four games straight, I think, and we get killed for for we got three hits in four games. I think it was tough or four th hits in three games, right? And I'm I'm laughing a little bit, but it's like it's like it's like almost like hard to hear. Like, how did that happen? You know, we get smacked around, right? So we're going into the tournament now. Like, what? Like, what are we doing here? Like, right? But we had a week after that to prepare, right? Because we were hosting too. So uh, we were hosting the first round of uh, our seed. So we get a week on our home field, and then, like, we were able to flush that, right? We flush that. We get into our tournament, and then everything clicks, right? We're hitting the ball over the park. We, we're not letting up many runs, and we just take off, right? We wind up beating Niagara in two games, and we get to the tournament. Um, and the tournament happens. We beat Mammoth 6-4 uh, or whatever it was. We came from behind and won. And then um, how the tournament worked is three games you win. That's it, right? Simple, right? If you win three games, you win the whole thing, right? Um, with the top seed, which is Fairfield, who is 30. Three and three that year. Yeah, that year Fairfield yeah. was out of control. They got an they got an at large. I think there was. I'm. I'm. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't quote me on this. I it might have been the only MAC team in like to ever get an at large. That's which, that sounds familiar. I know yeah. that year they were even playing in the playing in that conference. They were getting votes or it might have even been nationally ranked. Yeah, so that right. team was legit. Yeah. So and like obviously they were everyone picked them to win the whole thing, which makes it even better. But um. We get there, we, we win our first game, and then we have the game against Canisius, right? Um, and believe it or not, we're tied 1-1 in the top of the ninth, right? I come in the pitch, and I let up a run, All right? So it's 2-1 now, we're going to the bottom of the ninth, and all I'm thinking about is, wow, I just cost, I just cost <laughs> us the season, huh? Right? And... We wind up coming back, walking it off, winning two one, um, and I, it was just I, I, it kind of still leaves me speechless. It's kind of crazy to think about it. So we came behind back to back games. Now we play Fairfield in the third game. They have to beat us twice, right? Uh, and it was this is like something I've never seen before. I think we've hit we hit four four home runs in that whole season, right? We hit six home runs that day. That's awesome. It was a home run derby, right? And um, again, like uh, how the tournament works, it's back to back to back days. So like, I, I wound up starting that game too. So like, again, there's no time to feel bad for yourself. There's no right. time to do anything, right? Now you have to go, you got to go do a job, right? And you have to pick your team up the way they picked you up yesterday, right? And again, I owe my team a lot for that. that that's how a team works, you know? That's, that's the leadership we talk about, right? They picked me up. I got to pick them up now, right? Uh, definitely wasn't one of my best starts. I I went five innings, two runs, five Ks, I think, something like that around there. But uh, 
the second and third inning of that start, uh, I had bases loaded, no outs. Um, and I was able to get out of it. So I was, we were sweating the whole start, you know, like, like, but again, that like, leads to it, right? Like, again, like you have a job to do, right? So uh, that, I mean, the whole game was really fun. And like, it, it's, it's really interesting to look back on it. It still leaves me speechless. It's like, I don't really know how to talk about it because I can't believe it, especially winning 29 games two years ago in the last two years. Now we win the whole tournament. We're projected seventh. We're projected 17. Now we win the whole tournament. We finished third, win the whole tournament, right? So we win the whole thing. Um, and now as a Mac school, when you're watching, um, uh, what is it called? The selection show. Selection show, yep. Yeah. You're watching the selection show. As a Mac school, you're, you're thinking you're going up against Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, one of those guys, top four right, teams the in the country, powerhouse. right? Yeah, yeah, top four teams in the country. We're watching the selection show, and Louisiana Tech, their region, pops up on our screen. So they're the 16 team at the side at the time. So we're not even watching, right? We're like, all right, we're not going to get picked here. And then all of a sudden, on the screen, you hear Ryder University, right? So now we're in that region, right? We go down to Louisiana Tech, and the environment was crazy because I mean, there only was 5,000 people at the at the game, right? Which is, I mean, it's a lot, but it's not as much as like some other schools might have. But what happened with Louisiana Tech is two years ago or prior, or maybe the year before that, a tornado took out their whole field, wow. right? Which is uh, horrible, right? So they rebuilt it, brand new stadium, right? And just so happened a year later, they're hosting their first regional ever. So that place was going nuts, right? And uh, that was a really cool experience. Uh, the first game we didn't play how we wanted to, you know, we got, we got our butts kicked, just straight up, just got our butts kicked. That's that's really just how it went. Um, but again, now we got to play tomorrow against Alabama, who's an SEC school. We're a MAC school. Right. Alabama doesn't even know who Ryder is. You know, <laughs> neither does Louisiana Tech. You know, Louisiana Tech took care of us. They handled their business, right? But they don't. It's like it's always who's Ryder, you know, like that. So now we got to play against Alabama, and again, that's having this mentality that I try to teach these younger kids is. Nobody cares that you just lost right. by 15 runs. Like, it's over with, right? Move past it. Now we have to go to work, and we have to compete here now. And we wound up losing 2-1, but overall, it was a great experience. You know, it was fun pitching there. I didn't pitch in the first game. I pitched in the second game. But, I mean, something I'm forever grateful for, and I was able to do that uh, with Ryder. So, again, like, I'm grateful for the opportunity they gave me when they took a chance on me when I was throwing the ball 78 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour. And then it's kind of crazy to look back on like, okay, you were here and now you're pitching in the regional, right? And then, and then our next year, we're a game away from making it again or two right. games away from making it again. So, I mean, total flip-flop from my freshman and sophomore year to my fifth year and senior year. So, it was just, uh, it was just a really cool experience. I mean, there's nothing I can really do to uh, describe it, honestly. It's just like, it's like kind of surreal. You know, I still look back on like YouTube videos and the, place just going crazy yeah i just it has to be it has to be incredible stuff and it's awesome that you were able to get to a point where you could experience that and i think it's interesting too how your personal career throughout college kind of mirrors the team successes right like in the beginning there's some struggles trying to get the lay of the land and then as you continue to grow as a ball player your team continued to grow too and i think an important note there too is you're speaking to like the leadership environment and the culture like you said that you guys were able to build where it, you know, that stuff has value. I yeah. think especially in, in today's day and age in the game, a lot of kids are worried about individual accolades. But again, you get into that team environment once you get to college. And as much as the individual work is going to help you succeed, right? If we can build a culture where, like we said earlier, that's what's expected of you rather than something that should be applauded, then it can it can show how this culture can continue to help build a team and continue to grow. Um, so I know we talked a little bit before the show. NC State was the other team in your regional. Yep. And just in interesting, you know, fun fact note there is that's the same year that they had the, the COVID out when they were playing Vanderbilt late in the tournament, too, yeah, right? Yeah, which is, I mean, watching them play in the regional, they were on a, like, so Louisiana Tech, again, took care of us, beat us by double-digit runs, whatever it was. And then uh, I'm like, oh, my God, Louisiana Tech is times, like, third best offense in the country. I'm like, oh, my God, Louisiana Tech is going to run through this thing, right? NC State comes in, they win the whole thing. They right. win the regional, obviously, right? 
So they were, they were just playing on a different level. And it's funny because we couldn't get a flight um, to Rustin at the time. We couldn't get a flight down there. And NC State was nice enough to take their charter plane, give it to us, let us get on it, and then pick them up, right? So we were on the plane with the, those guys a little bit. We didn't talk much, but it was cool to see, uh, like, see the players and stuff like that and us be on the plane with them and then see everything that happened and be like, wow, like, I, I like, it's it's just tough to tough to watch, you know, tough to see like that happen to them. But right, yeah, I mean, listen, COVID COVID was what it was, and there was a lot of variables that came with it. It's certainly nice being on this side of things now. I'm I'm just surprised that you left out the charter plane piece of the story <laughs> when, yeah, when yeah. you're going through it the first time. No, but it must it must provide like a like a little bit of sense of legitimacy, and I think that's important to note, especially considering like how the advent of social media and how connected the world is, especially from a baseball lens today. And how kids are kids are really prominent in like posting their commitments and this yeah. is the school I'm going to and here's where I'm ranked, right? Like from Ryder, a small school out of the Mac, you're able to ride the same charter plane with NC State to go yeah. compete in the postseason in the same regional. Yeah. Right. And it's cool to see teams like that, like you guys at Ryder, or similarly to like NJIT going down to Arkansas, you yeah. know, last season or the season before, where it's like we're all it's all the same level like yeah. we're, you're everybody's competing against each other and there's no reason to think that you can't succeed or you're not on a legitimate ball club mm. just because it's not a big nationally known or internationally known name and i think that that's an important part of baseball in today's day and age where if everything's so connected i think there's going to be a little bit of like saturation that ends up going on with where kids are committing and yeah. what that starts to look like but like you touched on in the beginning, if if your focus is I want to go play and I want to be somewhere where I can contribute, yeah. your story goes to show just how valuable that can be in player development, how possible and attainable success at a really high level still is. And that's that's something that, you know, at least from my perspective, should be an inspiration to, to kids out there in high school now that are listening. Yeah. Um, from that, right? So we have an opportunity now. And I think I always I always end up circling back to that kind of lens on it just because our role now is more from a coaching side of the fence, mm. right? And be that as it may with what we did or the abilities we had going through our high school and college careers, right? What, what are some of the things outside of like a mentality and a focus and a recruiting and where you're going to college aspect from an X's and O's aspect of what you try to focus on with your pitchers when you're, when you're on the other side of the fence now giving lessons from a coaching perspective? Yeah. So, Again, so my first intro to coaching was with you, right? So we coached together. We coached 25 uh, team when they were freshmen, right? Yep. Freshmen. Right? ago now. So, I mean, obviously you don't know, but like that helped me a lot, right? Because I'm a guy who just like, again, like uh, you could kind of tell during this interview, I'm like, just get it done. Right. right? Just, I don't care what you have to do. Just get it done. Right. And that's comes back from how I was coached in high school and how I was, I was coached in college. Um, so watching you coach, right. Really like, let me take a step back and be like, and be like, and watching you talk to the players made me realize like, um, there's a certain way other than that to get through certain players. Right. Right. And you did a really, you do a really good job of that. Right. Like at the end of practice, I'm, I'm short to, to, and to the point and you're, you talk a lot more. Right. And again, there's two two ways to do everything, right? And I'm not saying which way is right or wrong, right? But you definitely helped me realize there's another way to do it, right? So watching you talk to the players, and like when we when we coached together, I was just with the pitchers, right? You coached the whole team. I was I was th first base coach and everything, right? So watching you do your work and how you coach definitely helped me when I wanted to get my own team, which I do now, right? Right. So I mean. The biggest thing I stress with my guys, right, and again, like, it's just to compete, right? That's, that's all I really care about. We need to compete. And then, like, an X's and O's thing on the mound is um, we, need to meet, we need to be able to make adjustments on the fly, right? Absolutely. Uh, Joe says it all, all the time. You, you got to make pitch-to-pitch -pitch adjustments, right? It can't take you two or three pitches to make an adjustment. Absolutely. It's too late, right? If I start 1-0, right, and I miss high and outside, I need to know my adjustment now before I make it 3-0. Yep. I need to make it one, one. Right. And then I need to make it one, two. Right. So that's the biggest thing I try to stress to these guys uh, when they're on the mound. Um, and like I said, like with, with our guys, like a lot of these guys have the ability to do it. It's just 
the mindset, right? We have to go out and compete. Like it's me versus you, right? I'm trying to get you out. You're trying to get a hit off me, right? Who's going to win, right? Who's going to, who, who's it going to, who's it going to be, right? It's me versus you. That's really all it comes down to, right? So I really talk about with my guys and, um, and they'll, they'll attest to this. I'm a big, uh, mentality type of coach, right? Uh, I talk about, uh, the mental aspect of the game a lot more than the X's and O's, right? So again, coaching with you really helped me understand a lot of the X's and O's too, right? Like yeah, that kind I of think, stuff. I think what you're saying is really important and I, it's, it's a similar thought process that I apply to things. I mean, well, first off, I appreciate, appreciate the love, appreciate the little shout out there. But I think the first thing that stands out to me is you, you, we talked about like the leadership that came on your college, on your college team, right? Where you get to be more of a lead by example guy. And then Pete Soporowski gets to be that guy that's vocal, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't, you know, like you're saying, I don't know if there's a right or a wrong way, but throughout my yeah, career, not. Yeah. what I've really been able to pick up on is the value in having both of those things at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like I had a similar relationship with Harry Rakowski when I was at yeah. Rutgers, where I was a guy that was a little more quiet, but I was always doing what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Harry, on the flip side, did what he was supposed to do to a higher level where he's playing pro ball now, but he wasn't afraid to get on somebody's collar and get in their grill and tell them this is the way it had to be. Yeah. And I think our staff got better because we had both of those voices going on. And now from a coaching perspective where we practice, even though we're coaching two separate teams, we practice together. They know that they can't mess around when they're, when coach Papp is watching, because you're going to get after Mm -hmm. them short and quick and to the point where there's no mistaking what's going on. And then I can come in and say, listen, guys, coach Papp is right. And we got to execute the X's and O's. And here's why it's valuable. If you want to blow the picture up and look at it from a macro level, I think that focus on the detail and the micro level of things from a, execution standpoint is really important and i think too getting into coaching now what's been valuable to me is how how does our understanding fit the execution i think a lot of times what happens is coaches will tell kids to do stuff the the kids aren't sure why that's the way it has to be done and i think when both of those voices can come together that's the value in it Mm. and even so like at the at the end there you're saying you're looking for a way to apply that to x's and o's or execution or whatever it might be i think looking at everything we do mechanics wise execution wise through a lens of competition is the most important thing right if if our goal is to make our adjustments and our desired outcome is to compete at a high level you're going to understand what your body tells you yeah you're going to have an understanding of your mechanics you're going to have to get understand your feedback you're going to have to be able to make those adjustments if your goal is to compete at a high level yeah i think sometimes when we get too much of a mechanical focus kids are saying oh i didn't do well today because I wasn't getting in my back hip. My front side was falling off. I was pulling my head or however it might apply to hitting. Mm, But if you're on the mound and you're saying my only focus right now is to compete the best way I can. And if it's me against the hitter, I want to win. So if that's your focus, I think your mechanics fall in line. I think your approach falls in line. I think your ability to adjust falls in line in such a way that it wouldn't be able to if we were solely focused on I got to make sure I load the right way. I got to make sure I'm getting good extension that lens of competition allows everything to fall in line underneath it. Yeah, 100%. So it's, and I, I want I want to get your take on this a little bit too. I know for me, it's been awesome to sit here from a coaching perspective and see, oh, like that's why I had to do the things I was doing in college or mm-hmm. this is the importance of this stuff. And then figuring out, even from a perspective of where we might've just been like lead by example guys when we were playing, now to have the platform to tell these kids the importance of this stuff. Like it's been cool to me to kind of learn more about baseball as I've gotten into coaching and now I'm responsible to speak on it. So I don't know, like what's your perspective on that? How, like how, how has that new role in the sport now impacted your mindset? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, a great question. Like, again, like you, like you just said, I was a guy who led by example and the reason, and I think a good way, I think that's a good thing because like if somebody looks at me and says, look how hard he's going, or I look at someone and say, look how hard he's going, who am I not to go as hard as him? Absolutely. You know, like, and that's, again, like I, to touch him back on Ryder really quick, that's why I think the, the turnaround was so crazy and that's how, why we got so good so fast or flipped it around so fast, right? We had a bunch of guys who just wanted to work harder than everybody else, right? Um, we, and we held each other accountable, right? Um, but it's just like a thing, you know, like I lifted today, I did my mobility, I did my yoga, I did my dry drills, what did you do? Right. Right? Like, let's, like, don't make me do more than you, right? So that's another thing, right? And how, like, 
I apply that to coaching now. But again, like coaching, you have to be more vocal, right? I'm the leader of the team, right? I try to put it into like a, a culture aspect. I try to I try to preach that to the kids, right? If you're doing what you're supposed to do, he's going to do what he's supposed to do. And Absolutely. if he's not doing what he's supposed to do, he's got to go, Perfect. right? Perfect. Or we have to have a talk, right? Hold your teammates accountable by your words if you want. But again, you can't hold your teammates accountable if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. 100%. Right? That's a conversation that we've had on the podcast before was the role that accountability plays. Yeah. And I think the, exactly as you're painting the picture, like if you want to be the guy that's a vocal leader on the team, you have to understand that that requires you to be a physical leader mm -hmm. and a leader in the sense that everybody, as much as you're going to tell everybody what to do, you're going to be able to go up to these guys when they're looking at you and you're going to be doing the right thing. Yeah. So that's really important. Right. So yeah. And to put that in like a coaching aspect of it, right. I have to practice what I, what I, what I, what I preach to them. Right. So if I tell them things that I never did, right. Like who am I, like who am I to tell them that, you know, right. Like I, the reason I tell my team certain things is because I experienced it and I went through it. Right. So I try to just preach to them the culture and I try to try to make them like come together and have, all the same mindset, right? Again, there's a bunch of different ways to do things, right? But you're all working towards the same goal, right? You're all holding your teammates accountable, right? You're picking them up when they're down, right? You want to be a guy that your team wants to play behind, right? So this is what I tell my team, right? If you're doing what you're supposed to do, he's going to want to play behind you, right? Um, and again, like you just said, you can't hold guys accountable if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Right. Right. So that's the big thing. I just... Uh, I just like, that's, a, that's a big thing I preach to my team. It's probably the biggest thing I preach to my, to my team, right? Everyone has to be going in the, in the same direction. And if you're not, we have a problem. So, I mean, that's just, a, again, that's just the biggest thing that I let these kids know. Right. Um, and that, yeah, that's really it. I mean, it's just a culture thing for me. Yeah. I think the, the emphasis you've put on culture isn't necessarily something that stands out right away when you talk about the X's and O's of baseball and all this stuff, but it's, like it's important to note how important it is when every everything we've talked about so far just always relates back to what kind of culture yeah. you've been able to build on the team. Um, I know just to wrap up here, I know some guys are going to be coming in the facility to lift. I don't know if your brothers are on the schedule for today, but the last the last thing I want to touch on with you is just what what it's meant to you to be that leadership guy, or what kind of relationship you've been able to build with with your brothers playing in high school now, looking to go through the same process that you've gone through and just having that support system of your parents and your family around you and how important that's been to your journey. Yeah, so um, my two younger brothers are in high school and uh, same as me, they're going to Old Bridge. Um, and it's honestly a little easier for me to work with them now because I'm done. Like I'm done with baseball, right? So they're at the right spots in their career where I could be the most helpful. To, for them right because i'm i'm done i've i've been through it like i've seen like what i've seen and everything like that um so now is a good time for them for me to be able to help them right and same thing with you like you, you coach your brother now right right so i try to do whatever i can to help them out and try to teach them and i, I i'll be as hard as possible i cannot on them and anyone else right, right. um and they, they share the same mindset I do, but it's something I teach them, right? So, I mean, it's just, it is good for me to be able to have the opportunity to help them out in any way, right? And uh, they ask me questions when they can and everything like that. I go, they come here, they come to the warehouse, which is a great place to be, right? Uh, they're getting some of the best baseball information they can here, some of the best lifts, some of the best um, lessons and everything like that. So, I mean, they're in a good spot right now, but... Um, again, it all comes down to, and I'll tell them this, it all comes down to how far you're willing to go and how much work you're really willing to do, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, well, apologize for some background noise here. Obviously like, you, you know, you just gave a little plug for the baseball warehouse business is booming here. Yeah. The phones are ringing off the hook. Um, yeah, man, I think, you know, as much as the culture thing applies to the team you're on, the culture can also apply to like the family aspect and, mm -hmm. and the relationships you're able to build and, you know, it's, you know, as much as we might pick on our younger brothers, it's definitely cool yeah. to see them going through those processes now. And my brother in college, your, your brother's in high school going through that recruiting thing at this point in their career. So it's awesome to just be able to like have a smile on your face when you yeah. look back at that stuff and have that be the environment you operate under. So yeah, man, that, that, you know, I, I, I guess I should have known better. I wasn't expecting to touch so much on that culture aspect of the game today, but 
it just awesome to awesome to hear your perspective and uh i can't thank you enough for coming on and having a conversation with me today yeah, i appreciate it yeah yeah joe it's been great yeah. thanks man appreciate you coming on um awesome conversation today with uh rider alum old bridge high school alum joe papio uh current coach here at the baseball warehouse so um, after, uh, after such a, such a great conversation, it's tough to sign off. I wish we had more time to yeah. talk, so maybe we'll have to do this again sometime yeah. for the green grass and white bases podcast. And for Joe Papio, I'm your host, Eric Reardon. We're signing off. It's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old.